Hi and welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, we're going to take a look at another repair. This is an Agilent N5230A, which is a 300 kilohertz to 13 and a half kilohertz network analyzer. This is a two port version of this instrument. I believe you can get this in four port as well. And the L, I think it stands for low cost. Now, even though it's a fairly old instrument, it still has excellent performance, almost 110 dB of dynamic range. It's fast sweep, it supports all kinds of different calibration, runs Windows. It's pretty good, it's a very reliable instrument, uh, even though this one's broken. So I want to take a look and see exactly what's wrong with it. Okay, so let's see what we have here. So the unit powers on just fine. It loads into Windows and then eventually boots up the software. The screen is nice and bright. The connectors in the front look quite nice. I haven't tried the floppy and other things, but I think it should be working fairly nicely. But there is uh, an, a problem with it. Now, when this unit initially powers on, it's going to go into S11 measurement mode and it's going to sweep from 300 kilohertz all the way to 13 and a half gigahertz, which is the full sweep range of this instrument. Uh, so somewhere in this sweep range, or perhaps during the entire range, we're getting a source on level error here. And this simply means that the instrument is not able to provide the desired or requested power at the measurement port. In this case, port 1, you can see we get the uh, lights flickering here. That's because it's sweeping uh, quite fast. And every time it sweeps, you get the forward transmission and reflection being measured at the same time, even though we're only measuring S11. So that means that something is wrong. So first thing is to check to see what kind of power we are requesting because this instrument I don't think can do the same power across the entire range anyway. So under the power menu, what do we have here? We have 0 dBm. So we're requesting 0 dBm and I know it cannot do that in the entire range, but it should be able to do above minus 6, I think. I have to check the data sheet very carefully, but who has the patience for that? So let's keep going down. So minus 1 dBm. Nope, still the error. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Nope, still the error. So that means now, okay, now we're at minus 10. So there's definitely a problem. This instrument should be able to do minus 10 at least. So let's keep going. Nope, we are at minus 20. Okay, there's definitely a problem there. Oh, there you go, it just went away. So at minus 26 dBm, uh, the error disappeared. So at some point, it is able to meet minus 26 dBm on the ports, uh, at least based on its own internal ALC measurement. So that means that something is wrong. There you go. As soon as I go back to minus 25, I'm getting this uh, unlevel error again. So something is up with that. So what do we do next? Well, one of the things we can do is change the sweep type. Instead of sweeping from 300 kilohertz to 13 and a half gigahertz, we can sweep in a CW mode and look at this one one as a function of time. And that would allow us to check every individual frequency whether it's going to show the unlevel message at different power levels, and then we can even measure the power coming out, the CW power coming out directly from the port. This is a useful thing to do because, as you know, as I've gone through many instruments and I've shown you many different types of uh, architectures, often these things are going to use synthesizers and multipliers in them and several different signal paths, no pun intended. And in that case, one of those paths could be bad, and, doesn't, and some of the other paths might still be okay. Okay, and here's our measurement setup. I have the output of port 1 directly connected to the input of an Agilent power sensor, which is then connected to the Agilent N1912A power meter, and that's going to give us calibrated measurements of the exact power coming out. I've repaired this in one of the previous videos, and this is actually one of the ways the lab grows. It's kind of a compounding effect. I have repaired so many equipment that just by those repairs alone, you could build a full lab, and that's one of the ways the lab grows, and I know a lot of people ask that question. So there it is. So now we have this, and I have it set to 1 gigahertz and minus 6 dBm. And you can see we're reading minus 5.74 dBm. Uh, so it's a little bit high, but it is correct. Now remember that for a network analyzer, the exact power coming out is not that critical. It doesn't have to be very accurate. It just has to be close enough. Usually about half a dB or even 1 dB is acceptable because you're making ratio measurements and not absolute measurements. We just don't want to be far off. Another thing to keep in mind is that as I change the frequency of this source, I have to go ahead and change the frequency on the power uh, meter as well in order to account for the calibration coefficients of the power sensor, the correction factors. So I'm not doing that neither, and there's some loss in the cable. So take all that into account as we change the frequencies. So let's go ahead higher and higher in frequency and see if it is okay. I'm just going to jump by a couple of frequencies at a time. So this is 1 gigahertz, we're still okay. Let's jump to 5 gigahertz. You can see at 5 gigahertz, we are still reasonably okay. So that's why we're not getting an unlevel error there. Let's go to 9 gigahertz. And 9 gigahertz, we are still good. We're requesting minus 6. We're getting a little bit less. It's probably actually quite accurate with the, with the corrections I mentioned. So let's go to 10 gigahertz. So we are still OK at 10 gigahertz. Now, I know that around 10.5, we have a problem. So let's type exactly 10.5 gigahertz. 
and we're still good. And I'm going to use this knob to go just over 10.5 and see what happens. There you go. As soon as I cross even 20 megahertz beyond that, right off the bat, we have fallen off the edge of the cliff, minus 26. And that makes sense. That's actually the exact number that we had to enter into here before the unlevel went away. So it's doing exactly what it does. That means the ALC and the power's internal power detector is working fine. So something else is wrong. And if I go all the way to the end of the frequency band, here's 13 and a half gigahertz. Yep, constant power. So it's flat, just you know, 20 dB down. So something is wrong. Well, what do we do? Well, I, we have to take a look at the block diagram, uh, but we're also going to, of course, open it and take a look. Now that we know this information, we should be able to know exactly where to go in the block diagram of this instrument to detect wha where the potential problem is, and then we take it apart and explore to see what's going on inside. All right, here is the block diagram of the PNAL. Now, the block diagram doesn't have the schematic components. It just has the blocks of the various modules that are inside the instruments. Fairly simplified, but of course, it's still going to be quite helpful. It's better than not having it at all. And this is going to be even extra helpful because we've done some measurements ahead of time and we know the symptoms of the instrument's failure and we can reflect that back on the knowledge we're going to gain from the block diagram. Last year, I was teaching a course at Columbia University in New York and the course was a theory and techniques for RF measurements and characterization. And one of the things I talked about in that course was the importance of understanding what is inside every instrument you use and how it works and how it's constructed, because it's going to tell you the limitations and the strengths of the instrument, allowing you to take the most out of it. And one of the things we talked about is understanding block diagrams. Now I've gone through many block diagrams of many types of instruments, and hopefully collectively, this will continue to help you uh, learn how to read these things and this is a fairly straightforward one. This is pretty much as simple as a network analyzer you can get. Uh, maybe the only one that I've looked at uh, with you guys was the Unritu one where we repaired that one. That one might have been a little bit simpler than this. So this is a Windows based machine. So obviously we expect to have uh, some kind of a CPU, motherboard, RAM, interface, LCD, all those things. Now those things don't have a problem in this case so we can just briefly glance over them. For example, let me zoom in over here. So here we go, this, this whole section revolves around the CPU and there's a hard drive, there's USB interfaces obviously, power supply to be expected, floppy drive, all the display controller with the keypad, uh, USB hubs and everything that's there. really pretty straightforward. Main CPU, RAM, ROM, GPIV interfaces, VGA, Ethernet, nothing unusual. And there's a main motherboard here, system motherboard. And the system motherboard is going to uh, sit at the core of the unit connecting a lot of the modules and interconnects between different things together. And you can see those nicely labeled here with different colors, telling you the signal flow between the different blocks. So these are not the issues. So let's go and start from frequency generation. This is a network analyzer. It needs to have synthesizers in it. And unlike a regular synthesizer, the phase noise isn't so critical. So we don't expect to see ultra low phase noise unit in there is still going to be good but it doesn't have to be as good as a dedicated synthesizer because there is phase noise cancellation that happens when you split signals and combine them and you're looking at ratios you're mixing the signal with itself essentially and that cancels a lot of the phase noise you don't have to worry so much about it, it doesn't make that much of a difference uh, so having said that let's go and start so as with any instrument there is a external 10 megahertz reference which you can give the instrument and the instrument gives you back a 10 megahertz reference inside that if I zoom in a little bit more so we can see, it's going to be our first frequency reference synthesizer. And this is a fairly straightforward one. You can see there is a switch here that's going to allow us to select uh, between what kind of source we're using, whether we're using the internal one. Let me make this a little bit thinner because I think I may have used it too thick here. So there it is. So we can also use the internal CXO which is the internal 10 megahertz reference, or if it's detected, an external one. This is a detector to automatically switch to the external reference. Uh, some feedback loop uh, going PLL architecture. Talked about this many, many times. Nothing unusual here, and there's a 10 megahertz VCO in there, which is gets divided by 10 to create the 10 megahertz. There's a uh, phase detector, phase frequency detector, typical, close the loop. Uh, I haven't done a tutorial on PLLs yet. It's something that I should be doing uh, but I haven't done it yet, I, I know, but I'll get to it at some point. But once the signal is generated, it's divided by two again, and we get a filter and a five megahertz reference. So that's that's what comes out of here. And it also comes out of here. 
also comes out of here. So that 5 MHz reference gets spread across the instrument and all other signals are derived from that 5 MHz reference used for phase locking so that they're all coherent. So we can follow that signal and see what happens to it. So there's two of it. One of it goes to this fractional synthesizer and if I follow it, I get an identical block here. So there's actually two of these in here. As you can see, one at the top and one at the bottom. And you need two of these because you need to be able to create two signals that are tracking each other with a fixed offset so that you can create an IF. So you have this super heterodyne sliding IF architecture, down convert receiver essentially, and then these two move with respect to each other. Now exactly how offset they are from each other depends on the architecture of the PNA, but in this case it's seven and a half megahertz. So it means that this guy this entire fractional synthesizer and this fractional synthesizer at the bottom work in tandem at the same time generating slightly different frequencies. Within here you have a multiple fraction and dividers and a couple of different ways for generating a range of frequencies and these frequencies are fed into the multiplier. You can see again two identical multipliers in a row. Everything has to be exactly the same up until the point where you're going to connect to the front ports of the instrument. So, so far everything is exactly the same. Now one signal is going to be sent all the way up there and we're going to follow that. Now, so that makes sense because one of these signals is going to be sent to the down convert mixer while the other signal is going to be sent to the front panel of the instrument. So the signal going forward from the bottom goes to the device under test, the signal going up goes to the mixers, reflected signals and through signals go back all the way at the top, combine and mix with this original signal, that's how you get your IF. So we can follow that. Now if I look at some of these numbers, I can see that this multiplier is going to generate a range of frequencies, 3 to 4.167. Those frequencies work, so we don't have a problem there. In this second band, they also work. In this third band, they also work. And they're all fed from this doubler. And these filters are simply to get rid of the harmonics depending on which frequency you're going to operate. So this is all working. And then you have another doubler where you can get 6 to 8.33 and then 8.32 to 10 and a half. Now we know the instrument works up to 10 and a half gigahertz. That's a really good sign, meaning that it's very likely that this block is functional. If this block had a problem, then something below 10 and a half would have been faulty, and it isn't. Now the signal at the top here, we don't know if this works or not because we haven't done any actual as parameter measurements to know if the mixer is receiving signal. So, but I'm guessing that it is working because we don't get any errors from that. And there is some ALC here, you can see some signal level detector integrator which then controls this attenuator here and controls this attenuator here and that gives you a leveled signal here and here for constant power so that you can have a, a proper amplitude level signal going to the device under test and going to the down convert mixers. So all of this makes sense and this is likely that this portion is working. So that's a good sign. We're going to follow this, uh, this top part later. After that, the signal is fed to uh, this unit called the switcher, splitter, lever, amplifier, <laughs> multiplier. I think they call it SS SLAM. I just blocked it, but the S SLAM is the kind of acronym for it. Anyway, so you can see that the signal coming here can take two separate paths. One path is up here, and then it goes into these terminations and switches and power dividers and detectors and couplers and all of that. But if I follow that signal, you can see a big portion of it goes this way, I'm going to follow that, and and there it is, there's our coupler, and then there's our port, there it is, port 1. So we can now, we know exactly the signal flow, the signal path, where we get to the port of the front end of, uh, of the instrument. So the coupler and everything is most likely functional, if there was a problem with the coupler, and anyway, this coupler is a passive uh, device anyway. If there was a problem with the coupler, we would see it across the entire frequency range, but we don't. But check this out. We come a little bit over here and we see this block. And this block is supposed to operate from 10.5 to 13.5 gigahertz. That's exactly the frequency range where the instrument doesn't work. So we have basically narrowed down significantly where the flaw could be. Now remember this 10.5 to 13.5 gigahertz that you see here is not replicated at the top. And you can take a guess why that is. How could they generate a fixed IF with a super heterodyne architecture if they don't replicate this path? I'm going to let you think about it as I explain it and it's going to become clear. And of course the second port, uh, port 2 over here, is just simply 
a different switch configuration. So depending on forward, backwards, and reflection, whether you're measuring S11 or S22, S21, or S12, this switch is going to automatically switch and give you power at the different ports. And there's an identical coupler here. This reflected signal from the coupler goes all the way up, which you need, of course, in order to be able to measure the S11 and S22. And uh, the return path over here from, from this, we can have again switches that feed the signal all the way up here. So all of the four signals, there's two here and the two here, which you need to measure as parameters are getting pushed up. At the same time, we have this test motherboard here, which gets a portion of the coupled signal out. There's a detector here and a detector here. And these two detectors are going to help do amplitude leveling. And you can see the signal after getting some comparison offsets, drive, blah, 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 compensation DAX and integrators go back over here and control this attenuator. So that's how you get leveling signal. And this is in fact the block that warns you that you're unleveled at the output because you can see that this final attenuator is right after all the multipliers and switches. Now you may also say, well, could the switches be faulty? And it's possible that the switches are faulty, but not very likely because they do work properly when the path is selected up here. That path seems to be working just fine because we do get signals from 300 kilohertz all the way up to 10 and a half gigahertz. It's this frequency range at the bottom that doesn't work. So that is a hint also. So we can continue going up and see what is happening to these signals coming back. And as we would expect, exactly we are going to have a down convert mixer array and this signal is the LO signal that has the offset getting amplified simultaneously one two three four five times we got all of these mixers there's a reference node mixer over here and it's actually not being used which is interesting I didn't realize that there is an unused path here I have to think about what they're what they're doing with this one. Oh, it says with uh, with spur avoidance off huh maybe they're doing this with some kind of spur cancellation. That's interesting. So here are the four signals returning A, R1, R2, and B. Classic as parameter signals coming back, amplifying necessarily, and then going into these four mixers. Low pass filter, 7.66 megahertz signal coming out, which is what you would ultimately digitize. You take the ratios, and from that, after calibration, you get your S parameters. Now the reason you don't need a 10.5 gigahertz signal here is because when the instrument is operating uh, between 10 and a half and 13 and a half, these mixers do not operate on, on the fundamental LO anymore. They operate on the third harmonic. So this frequency gets scaled back by a factor of three after 10 and a half to 13 and a half. And this is done so that you don't have to uh, create a replica of this block over here. This is all done so that you can save. If I can move this, it doesn't seem to move anymore. Well, that's not nice. Why is this so slow? This is a very slow computer. There you go. So you don't have to replicate this block down here. I know why this is so slow. It's because I drew so many times all over it. Uh, you don't have to replicate this. This avoids the requirement for these multiplier switch to be replicated just like everything else is replicated and they're just simply operating the mixers at the third harmonic. So having said that, let me do a full screen. That completes the picture. And then finally, at the end, we have an array of digitizers uh, here, multiple ADCs for digitizing. It's still interesting that there is an, an extra one. They must be doing some, some cancellation with that, but I have to think about it. So there it is. That's the entire architecture of this down of this um, network analyzer with every bells and whistle. It's actually really simple. It only has two synthesizers, one here and one here. Or I should say one here and one here. The reason is because it only does fundamental S parameters. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't do X parameters. It doesn't do uh, IP2 or IP3. It doesn't do compression. It doesn't do THD. If you want to do those measurements, you have to have many synthesizers. So the state-of-the-art PNAX is like seven or 10 synthesizers in it so that you can look at all the different harmonics, you can do multiple tracking, a sliding IF, a heterodyne uh, down convert stages so that you can look at so many things at the same time. That's why these things are so heavy and they're so big because they have so many synthesizers in them. And then they, have, they can even do multi-tone. It's pretty sophisticated. So this is a <coughs> low cost version essentially. I think that's what the L stands for, for the PLA, PNAL. So we have narrowed down from this entire system a tiny place to to focus on. So now we need to go and open it 
I'm trying looking for how to zoom around here. So we have to go and open the instrument and look at this little area down here, see what we can get. Sorry for all these lines are all over the place. Hopefully you followed that. And uh, let me know what you thought about uh, going over it like this, but I think this is probably the best uh, method that I found. Now let's go take a look, open it up and identify all of these different blocks and finally find where this guy is so we can take that apart and see if we can find the issue. All right, here's the inside of the instrument. This is the bottom of the unit where all the microwave modules are installed. The other side is where the synthesizers, motherboard and everything else is. So there's two ports, obviously. Here's one port up here and one port up here. And the very first thing we see are two couplers, directional couplers, exactly as we would expect. It's a fairly broad band from 300 kilos to 13 and a half gigahertz, but they make them from almost the DC to 65 gigahertz. So it's, or 67 gigahertz, so it's not that unusual. Uh, so having said that, you can see the couple port up here and the through port there. There's a through port and a couple port. So now all we need to do is to follow these two signals because these are the signals that we know are the having problems above 10 and a half gigahertz. So if you look at that, you can see that this signal comes from this module in the middle here. And this signal up here also comes from the module here. And this module also provides another signal coming out of it, going into this one, and another one with this longer cable is going into this one. So right off the bat, uh, we can identify that this is indeed the module we are interested in. This is the one that does, th th this is the S-SLAM module, so-called, that has the multiplier leveling and all the other functions to connect to the output port. So this is the suspect module. And uh, it's connected with a ribbon cable. It's kind of really loose in there. Uh, to this main motherboard here. There's a couple of interesting things to note. This is full of LEDs on it, and a bunch of them are on. I think these are power supply LEDs. This LED uh, lights up to tell you which port uh, the power is being applied to. And right now it's applied to this port, which goes into here, and this is indeed port one, which is to be expected. If I switch to port two, then this LED, uh, somewhere up there, if I can't find it right now, but anyway, there's another LED somewhere up there that will light up showing you that the power is going to port two. And this LED over here that blinks, is actually quite interesting because this is exactly the LED that blinks whenever the signal is between 10 and a half and 13 and a half gigahertz. So we even have a visual indication for when this module is operating in, in the region of operation where it has a problem. So this is all very useful. There's a red LED up here. And you can see this LED lights up when the signal is unlevel, uh, which is also, we know that happens towards the end. Now that right now the power is set to zero dBm. So let me lower the power. Uh, from z uh, from 0 dBm to minus 6 dBm. That way, it only goes on level at the end of the sweep. And you can see, if you look carefully, you can see a correlation between when this lights up and when this lights up. That's because this is the one that tells you you're in the 10 and a half, 13 and a half gig region, and this one tells you that you're in that region, you're actually on level. So there's a lot of visual feedback. None of, none of that visual feedback is going to help us, of course, because that you have to see what's going on with this. Now, this is a fully enclosed microwave module. But the nice thing is that all the cables are available, which means that I should be able to take it out, have it flat, and then even look inside of it while it is running, connected to the instrument, because it needs all of this connection for me to test it. I can't test this on its own because I don't know what goes through here. Uh, now, having said that, there's a couple of other things to note. This signal over here and this signal over here are the two signals I talked about which are the, uh, detecting the power coming out of port one and port two of this module. And this signal coming back here is the signal that controls the attenuator. So everything is very clear. And if you also look here, you can see there is two unpopulated uh, signals over here. And these are um, no doubt for a four port version of this instrument. So this motherboard clearly can be used for the four port uh, version of it as well, because you can have uh, R3 and R4. Uh, reference 3 and reference 4, which would be for port 3 and port 4. So there's another uh, version of this module here that will have four outputs as opposed to only two. This is all very interesting. doesn't get us any closer uh, to solving the problem, of course. There's a lot of options this unit can have, which is not populated. You can have mechanical attenuators, which would surely sit around here. I probably control from these guys, and none of that is populated. A lot of other options can be here. That's why it's so empty. I think it's just a bare bone instrument. It has one option, but I forget which, which one it is right now. Hard drive over here that runs Windows running on it. Interestingly enough, the bias D inputs are back here. And this connector is going into a fuse, uh, which are over there. So oh, I should say these are the bias Ds and there's the fuses. So the bias D signals, the DC signals exist on this motherboard. 
and somehow need to get to the ports. Now, the most logical place for them to go is through this ribbon into this module, which then can put it on this line here, which is a short to the output. That's probably where the BIOS-D is implemented, because this coupler doesn't have a BIOS-D in it. So that's another interesting little fact about it. Uh, what else is here that is of interest? I believe, let me think, I think everything else is pretty self-explanatory. Nothing really unusual going on aside from that. These are our final, are these the mixers? It could be, I have to look on the other side. Now if you look carefully here, there's a connection right here. That connection there is coming from the other side of the board. Yes, this must be the mixer because you can see uh, the last LO going to it. Interesting, I have to think about it. So uh, th this is the LO coming into this, which then gets multiplied. So this signal is most likely working because it is within the range less than 10 and a half gigahertz. So that signal is probably there. This is the other one, the, the other replica one with a slight shift in it, which goes into this module. Okay, all of that is nice and great. Now what do we do next? Let me see, do these go back to the other side? Yeah, this has got to be the mixer, mixer batch then. So now I say we take this out. And first of all, take a look at what it looks like. And look how nice the details are. For example, you see all these screws that have blue marks on them and these screws that don't have blue marks on them? Whatever that has a blue mark on it does not contribute to the module coming away from the unit. It is a screw holding the module together. So that's why you know you don't take off a screw you're not supposed to take off. If you're only interested in, for example, removing this coupler, don't take off these four screws. These have to do with the coupler itself, which I think that's what is going on. Clever, somebody actually you know, marked these manually. And it's with the old Azure and stuff, very carefully put together, as with all the new ones. Okay, great. Let's go take that out and see what it looks like. And here's our module. Very e easy and straightforward to take off. And on the other side, a lot of screws. So this uh, screws is going to take uh, this cap off and hopefully is not covered completely with an RF absorber like the other amplifier we took apart the other day. And we can actually look what's underneath it. Now what I'm really worried about is that whatever is inside here is completely wire bond that dies on ceramics and so on, in which case I wouldn't be able to fix it very easily because I wouldn't be able to replace it. I don't have a wire bonding machine, unfortunately. Maybe that's one of the things I should start thinking about. But uh, I haven't ha come across needing it very often. So then we can take a look and see what's going on with it. Now, before I follow all the you know components of what's on it, I am not a patient man, so I want to see what's on the other side of this right away so we can get a quick idea of the architecture and match it to the block diagram we see. Uh, this over here is uh, playing probably the role of a heatsink, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, interestingly, I can't see exactly what it is touching. I have to see. It's weird that they put here this uh, plate here. I can't quite tell what it's, what it's connected to. But, okay, let's go. Everything is labeled, so it's actually really safe to take apart. And every one of these has an individual uh, shrink wrap with the you know, label, tape, and everything. Just Awesome, awesome for servicing. This was when it was uh, serviceable components. Obviously, this itself is not serviceable, but removing it and putting this module back and forth is. These are also extremely EST sensitive. You have to be very careful. So let's go one step at a time. Looks good though. It's a nice little microwave module. All right, here are all the screws. Let's take a look and see what we got here. Be very careful. And, oh, oh gee, there is a, there's an RF mesh under here. So I have to take that off as well. I think it's loose. Uh, I gotta get some tools to get that off. All right, we gotta be pretty careful here. So reaching around the screws, I can lift it. Oh, I see this is not gonna be easy to fix. Let's see. Oh, it's really stuck. It's been pressed down really hard, but this is an excellent way to shield it. Oh, look at that. Yep, that's what I was worried about. It looks like there's a lot of wire bonds going on in there and I already I can already see the doubler path right there but it's nice because we can see exactly what pin is used uh, for that doubler path so I'm gonna have to take a close look at this let me see if I can zoom any more so this is nice the signal flow is quite clear everything after it works because everything after it is couplers and everything else that we know works look at that it's beautiful it's really pretty so we have to look at this under the microscope I think that's the only way to really understand what's going on and, and see if this is fixable. Now, I have to think of a way to monitor where the failure happens, but it is likely that it is that doubler there. But okay, let's get the microscope. We gotta do this one step at a time. And here's a close look inside the module at the area in which we're interested in analyzing. 
Now, one of the nice things about modules like this is that they're made of individual mimics and ceramic components and filters and transmission lines and microstrips. And this allows us to individually identify the components and associate them with the block diagram. So it is fairly simple to analyze at least because not everything is in just one integrated circuit. Essentially built block by block as if it was a block diagram. So we can identify the components and go forward from there. I'll show you the rest of the stuff that's on the module, but this is the area of a suspect. So let's analyze quickly here. So this is where the signal enters this little section of the circuit. Now the signal coming from here can have any frequency between 300 kilohertz to 10 and a half gigahertz. For frequencies between 10 and a half gig and 13 and a half gig, as we explained, there's a doublet involved. And then the frequency coming in gets stepped down to half that frequency and gets doubled, which means that there is a switch uh, that can select which path you're following. And there's a solid state switch right here. So this is a normal forward path, you can see. There are two switches, one on each side, allowing the signals below 10 and a half gigahertz to be switched into the main path. And in between these two switches, nothing more than a bunch of strip line ceramic pieces, no, nothing unusual, wire bonded together. It's just to create a, you know, this length of the signal to go through. And these uh, switches are solid state switches, maybe a gas of some kind. We have to take a look, when we take a look closer at it, and it's very straightforward architecture from the switch point of view. And the controls voltages for the switches enter the device uh, from this uh, pin over here, and then from another pin that's just outside uh, for controlling. So there's two control voltages, one over here, one over here, and there is one for the other switch as well, which I'm guessing they're in tandem so they can be switched at the same time. So one thing that could potentially be wrong is that perhaps the voltages from the control of the switches aren't working. And that would be a good thing because that's, that can be fixed and we don't have to touch a microwave module. That's a problem on the PCB connected to the module. So we can then analyze that if that is the problem. So we have to mark these and find out where they are and then measure them when the instrument switches between the two states. So we are lucky if that's the problem. The other problem is that one of these switches is bad, or at least one of these switches is bad on the path which selects a double path. And that would be bad because if the switch is bad, then I wouldn't be able to really replace that without getting a replacement part. And this space here is really cramped. So that would be a problem. Uh, it's hopefully a little bit less likely. It's less likely that that's the case, but we can, we can find out by doing a relative measurement uh, from the forward path to the coupled path or the switched path. And that is quite difficult also, because if you look, the width of these lines are pretty small. And we're looking at about 300 micron, which is a width of the strip line module. So we would have to probe this and we'll have to probe it at a couple of gigahertz. I don't have an active probe. I don't have an active probe around three gigahertz, which we could potentially use just to see if the, the switch is uh, working, but we wouldn't get an exact value measurement. We would get a relative measurement. I could also make a poor man's probe and I'll show you that. It's just gonna be difficult touching these traces to make a relative measurement. And then if you follow the signal, let's say the switches are working, then the signal goes up here through this um, transmission on my strip line again, and it goes into this component. Now I can't identify this component. It does have an Agilin part number on it, 1GT13857. It looks like a capacitor to me, not exactly sure why they have it here because the integrated circuit which follows, which I'll talk about in just a second, has input and output uh, capacitors embedded in them. They're AC coupled at the input and output as most, most likely gas PHEM devices here. You have that anyway. And there is an identical one here. And the reason they don't look the same is because there's a reflection from the microscope light on it. So I don't know what these are. And that's a little bit puzzling, but let's assume for a moment that they are just decoupling capacitors. Then we have an active circuit here, and this is a circuit that unfortunately could also be bad. This is an active doubler. So there's a doubling circuit in there, an amplifier, and so on and on. And that creates the second harmonic that we're interested in. And then again, goes through this some component here. Uh, this component itself has two power supplies. There's plus five volt coming from here. And then there is minus five volt uh, coming from here. So it's a dual supply plus and minus, nothing unusual there. And then there's a component here, which could be some kind of a voltage regulator, something to bias the devices inside this active multiplier. It's fed from the minus five volt supply. Uh, it could be something else, whatever it is, it's working in tandem with this IC. So having said that, after that, there's a component here, which looks like an attenuator. You can see deposit resistors most likely here. This is a small attenuator, uh, probably an attenuation, maybe 6 dB, 3 dB. You can see the resistor in between. So, that looks fine. And then after that, we have our filter, which I talked about earlier. I've talked a lot about these kind of devices. 
it's just a 10 and a half to 13 and a half bandpass filter to get rid of the harmonics, undesired harmonics and the fundamental leaking through the active multiplier. So pretty straightforward. And then the signal comes down here and joins the switch again. So you can select either the double path or the through path as I explained earlier. So in terms of structure, it looks pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, if this uh, active multiplier is dead, then that's gonna be a problem. Again, same as the switches, replacing that requires a wire bond and the the actual IC itself. Now, if we start playing around with this and if we damage these components at the top, that would be a shame, but uh, this path isn't working at the moment anyway. And if the doubler is a problem, um, I may explore some other ways of fixing it, but I have to be convinced that this is actually the problem. So now having said that, we can look at all these control voltages. So it could be that the power supply for the doubler isn't working or the control voltages for the switches aren't working. If that's the case, then that will make our life a lot easier because that problem is on the PCB. So we can explore that and look at that. So there's a lot of testing and analysis we have to do. I also want to show you a little bit about what's inside these modules uh, by showing you a much higher magnification so you can see the devices. They look quite nice uh, as, as you would expect. So, and you can see the part numbers and, and the labels on them too. So it looks good. Now let me show you a little bit for the rest of the module and uh, then we can go back and look at a higher magnification and then we have to jump back on the bench to do some testing. All right, let's just scan a little bit more around here so you can see where the input comes from. There it is, some similar attenuators and so on. There's another component here which is interesting. I have to take a look. It looks similar to the one I can't identify but it has many more uh, components on it. I wonder if it's, if it's active or not. So anyway, you can see the coupling capacitors here on this. This the coupling capacitors don't have to go above 10 and a half gig, but if you have these, I don't see why you would use the decoupling cap up there. So that's still a mystery. Let's go back. Here's another attenuator at the input, and right there, the input is AC coupled. So AC coupled, attenuated, AC coupled again, connected to some what appears to be perhaps a small amplifier, not sure. There's our switch, the path we just looked at. If we continue on, we have another amplifier and another amplifier. Uh, these are necessary to boost the signal most likely. Or it could actually be, no, I take that back. This could be an attenuator actually. Uh, this could be a, this is probably an amplifier followed by a variable attenuator. So I'm not sure what the variable attenuator is. Oh, I wonder if that's what this is. Perhaps that's a pin diode of some kind. Interesting. So anyway, let's keep going. Over here, you can see all these individual components is crazy. And then uh, we would follow with that. Now this definitely looks to me like a distributed amplifier. Now we continue going forward. There's going to be some more. And that's definitely a distributed amplifier. You can see so clearly the distributed amplifier lies on this wiggly lines right here. You can see this, all these lines over here. So then there's another one. And oh, this line is not going to move, is it? Let me get rid of it. And we can see more. Where's the attenuator? I have to go back to the diagram again. Okay, so here's another switch. This is what switch. This switch switches between S22 port and S11 port, or port 1, port 2, for measuring S12, you know, and uh, S22, and, and vice versa, and so on. So it all makes sense. And then there's two identical paths, and this path includes the attenuator, the detector, the coupler, uh, all of those things. Here we go. This is the path where the signal goes directly to the port. If I can find my marker, there you go, this path, the signal goes to the port. And this path, the signal goes to further dividing and getting detected, amplitude detection. Continue forward, where is the final detector? I can't find it, it's somewhere around here. So anyway, I don't want to waste too much time right now analyzing this because I'm eager to trying to fix the actual module itself. There's, there's a lot to talk about, you know, we can spend an hour just talking about this module alone. But Having said that, let's go back to the area of which we're interested in and do some analysis there. But let me first put the microscope, maybe we can take a, a much closer look. Now that I see this component here and I see it being used the way it is, it might be worthwhile uh, to take a closer look and see if we can identify that missing, that mystery component so we, we can know if whether we should replace it or not, perhaps, or perhaps that's the problem itself. That should be an interesting thing as well. And here's a close look at the input of this device that's suspect essentially. This is not the switches of course, this is the active amplifier there which I think does the doubling and amplification. And you can see that the input is indeed, definitely does look like to be AC coupled. There's an input capacitor there, separated, there's some biasing lines coming in, we've got, we've got an active device there. 
and a really gigantic inductor that this may not seem very large it's about a hundred micron across I believe that's about 100 micron across but this is a pretty big inductor it has many turns but the frequency of operation here is low it's around 13 gigahertz or so actually this is on the input so it's even less about six and a half gigahertz and uh, you know the inductors that I make is about 20 times smaller than this because we're looking at over 100 110 20 gigahertz so this is a fairly large inductor by the standards that I'm used to now if you look around a little bit more you can see some of the other features of this device and there's one area in here where I saw some devices which maybe may have some damage there this so it's really hard to move this by hand but you can see a little bit of damage in, on these devices if we can get them back in focus there you go uh, right there you can see some damage here yeah sorry it's very difficult to get this you can see it vibrates so much because our magnification is right now 875 times so you can expect some problems yeah but it looks quite nice let me some more inductors you can see there's an output port you can see there is a inductor at the output port as well and the output also seems to be I can get this in focus output also seems to be AC coupled or is it, yeah it is also AC coupled let me get rid of these so you can see a better closer look at it there it is you can see some series inductor definitely from matching here and an LC network at the output L is a shunt L and this biases these all these big devices of large devices at the output and so probably puts out quite a bit of power and uh, yeah, there's some other additional ports which are actually not used, which is also interesting. Yeah, it looks nice. And the component that I can't identify is this one. But having looked around a little bit more, I saw instances of this device here where they had wire bonded right across it, which leads me to believe further that this is just a capacitor, that I shouldn't have to worry about it too much. But either way, something to keep in mind. Now I can go over, again, so many things here, but I do want to show you the distributed amplifier, if I can get the light on it, so you can see what I was talking about. And we have to find the focus on this as well. And there it is. Look at that. There's our distributed amplifier. So you can see the, the line at the inputs and the line at outputs. There's got these wiggly lines going between the input and the output devices. It's stage one, stage two, stage three, four, five, six stages of distributed amplifier. And a very interesting mesh bonding technique here. At the output, you can see that's what they use. They don't use a wire bond, and this is a much lower inductance, of course. And then you can go to ribbon bonding for further improvement. An interesting uh, observation here. But like I said, you can talk about these things and design these, these things all day. What we're interested in, whoa, this is moving around so much. What I'm interested in is mostly uh, to see if we can fix it. So let's go through all the tests that I spoke about earlier and take it one step at a time and see if we can do anything about it. And even if we can't fix it, I think the learning experience here and looking at all these components and the approach should be still very valuable. And here is our test setup. So I have the unit outside and essentially connected in almost all of its ports that matter. Uh, the input coming from the synthesizer from the back of the unit is connected to the input. The output that would normally go to the coupler connected to port 1 is also connected. It's going to my spectrum analyzer. Uh, power is connected and the detectors and the VGA control is connected. So. Uh, the other ports are really not necessary for the test we're doing. Now, right now, the instrument is set to below 10.5 GHz. And my spectrum analyzer over there, you can see I have a tone here at 10.449 GHz minus 4 dBm. Now, actually, this is also too low, uh, which is now beginning to worry me. I think this instrument is supposed to be able to do 0 dBm at this frequency. So I'm beginning to be more and more worried that something is wrong uh, in one of these switches. But anyway, let's go ahead and do some measurement to find out and I went ahead and I labeled I took a picture and I labeled what all these connectors are let me zoom in so we can better appreciate what I'm talking about as you can see we had all these different connectors these connectors connected the module on the other side so I can measure the voltage at various points and see if they change when I go from high band to low band with the doubler without the doubler making sure that the active multiplier has the plus or minus 5 volt power supply I can do all of these tests uh, directly on this so that's pretty handy. So let's go ahead and do some of those measurements and see what happens. And if you can see right now, we are just below 10 gigahertz. Sorry for zooming in and out. Uh, if I go right above 10.5 gigahertz, uh, this light should eventually turn on. There it is. You can see this is below, this is above. So in this mode, we have the high band active, and in this mode, we have the low band active. So right now, we are at the edge of low band. So I can go ahead and measure all the power supply voltages and everything to make sure it's working. So I'm going to zoom in here. And let's do some measurements based on what I have already labeled on my phone. Uh, let's check the power supply to the multiplier. 
just one second if I can get my phone unlocked here so I can see what I'm supposed to probe and according to this I am looking for let's see what am I looking for I'm looking for this point here there you go that's minus 5 volt that's good this should be plus 5 volt that's good great so that means that the plus and minus 5 volt power supply of our active multiply are present and are at the correct voltages so that's a good sign so that means the power supply is working although you would kind of prefer if that was broken because that'd be an easy fix and let's look at the switches on the high band and the low band starting from the output working our way back so I believe that's one of them so this is sitting at 9 volts okay so now if I change from low band to high band there you go that goes minus 9 ah there you go that makes sense there you go so we got plus 9 volts to minus 9 volts and that switches the switch from high band to low band that makes sense now the other switch should be doing the exact opposite so if this is minus 9 the other one should be plus 9 and it is indeed plus 9 and if I go low band you can see that the switch is perfect so the switches on the output side after our active multiplier are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing the voltages are changing and if I go on the input side my phone keeps locking up here what do we have here where is that I believe that this is another power supply 14 volts perfect that's working so here's one of our switches Ooh, minus two now that is wrong so let me go high band yeah I see it goes to zero only it should be going from minus nine to plus nine that's very interesting now the other switch oh it's minus one it's totally off you should go plus yep yep this is not working okay so what is wrong here well there's two possibilities one possibility is that the switch is completely dead and is pulling these outputs down not allowing them uh, to become positive 9 and minus 9 volt the other possibility is that the driver that's driving these voltages is dead which would be the absolute best case scenario because in that case we can just find out what is wrong on this PCB and fix it that would be amazing yeah but minus 2 is definitely not correct and if I go to high band again yeah, see, it should be plus 9. And now this is negative. Yep, it should be minus 9. And yeah, it doesn't work. Okay, that's really promising. I can already see one of them is connected to an LM399 comparator. So that is also interesting. We can check to see if that comparator is dead. But in order to find out uh, whether this problem is with the switch or with the comparator, we have to maybe separate this from the module and, and run it without the module connected at the bottom. And I think that's, I would say that's probably okay. Uh, sh nothing should happen uh, we should still get plus and minus 9 volts if it does plus and minus 9 volts without the module then the switch is pulling those outputs down and shorting them if not then the problem is with the comparator then we can start thinking about replacing that well I did test the power supply voltages and everything on the board and the control signals on the board and without the module installed they are correct which is bad it means that there is something wrong with the switch and we can measure the resistance of the two switches since they're identical and essentially identical in configuration we should be able to see them uh, behave identically from resistance point of view as well so here's the working switch you can see the resistance between them is essentially infinite as to be expected because of the configuration of the switch and there is no resistance to ground from either of the pins that also is to be expected but on this switch if I were to measure you can see the resistance between the two ports of the switch is 130 ohms and resistance to ground from one port is 91 ohms and from the other port is 37 ohm so yeah unfortunately there is something wrong with it so we can't use it as it is anymore and that means that we have to replace the switch let me show you what the switch looks like under the microscope and here is the switch you can see the devices very clearly these are the control voltages and I'm showing this part of it because that's the part number for this die now even if I had this die I wouldn't be able to replace it because I don't have a wire bonding machine you can see some wire bonding here on the right side uh, so this is the RF input for instance and the two outputs are at the top and the bottom you can't see them from the angle I'm looking at right now so yeah we're kind of stuck now I have a couple of ideas on how to approach this to potentially change it and fix it but you have to keep in mind that as soon as I touch this switch I'm destroying the forward path too now the forward path isn't working up to specification but it is at least working with a reasonable output power you know below minus 6 dBm it should be meeting 0 dBm and that's not surprising because the switch is indeed broken so this was an unlikely type of failure where the switch somewhat works there's probably so much amplification after the switch in the chain that you recover the signal but it's not very good for SNR and so on okay 
Well, having said that, let's take a look inside the module again. I'll let you know what my plan is and then we'll decide what to do in the next video. So the entire area that we have to work with is this absolutely tiny switch right there. So we do have about a few millimeters all around it. So one thing I could do, which is quite a bit risky, is to buy a solid state switch IC in a QFN package, about three millimeter by three millimeter, and jam it in there and try to microwire everything onto the strip lines and to the input, uh, which is now decoupled by this capacitor right there, and use these control signals to power the switch essentially. So that's one way to go about it if you don't want to replace the die. Now, I'm going to do that, I'll try to do that, but I thought that since we discussed so many things, instead of keeping this video until I have all the parts and time to do it again, I'll release it and then I, your feedback would also be quite interesting to see what you guys think about it. Or if they have any other ideas that I could explore in replacing this part. Or if you have a wire binding machine that you don't need or if you know a good price one that I can potentially buy, and then we can maybe get some dies and replace it properly. So there's a lot of interesting things we can do. But either way, I hope you enjoyed this video. We know what the problem is. We just don't have the part to replace it at the moment, which itself I think is quite valuable, especially when we went over so many of the details of how the instrument works. But if we do get it, then we will do a full replacement and a full verification of the instrument calibration and measurement, which itself will be quite fun. So I'll label this as part one, and hopefully we'll get to part two soon.